made up arguments with yourself in the shower, which is all fine and good to sharpen your debate skills. However, when it comes to painting, you want to avoid fighting with yourself as much as possible and remove obstacles before you encounter them. So in this lesson, we're going to cover several topics to help pave the way for successful painting. First, we'll talk about surface, what to paint on, and how to prepare it. When you have a well-prepared surface, the paint will go on easier and you won't have to be battling the paint. Then we'll move on to blending. Blending takes practice. Seeing the type of gradient you want will help you know how you're doing. Work quickly to blend acrylics or use a slow drying medium. Finally, we'll tackle brushwork. If you've been doing the brush handling exercise from the first lesson, you've already discovered the wide variety of marks that are possible depending on how you hold and move the brush. Finding the type of brush marks that suit your personality is a wonderful journey. Having a variety of different types of brush marks in your painting can make it more interesting to look at, and for me, that is always a goal. But before we pick up our brushes, let's look at some interesting surfaces. You can paint on almost anything. Good options are wood panels, canvas, and linen. I often like to find strange objects from the thrift store and paint on them. We'll address painting on unusual surfaces in a later lesson. So for now, let's look at the more traditional surfaces, canvas and panel. I like to paint on canvas or panel, depending on the situation. I love panels because they are hard and they can take some roughing up. I can sand it, strike it, and jab it without having to worry about poking a hole in it. Panels are also very affordable. If you go to the hardware store, they have a variety of panels that can work. Masonite, hardboard, and plywood are all great candidates. I recommend at least a quarter inch thick. Any thinner than that and we'll start bending and warping, making your painting look cheap and weird. Then if you ask nicely, they can cut it into manageable sizes for you. The downside of panels is that they can be quite heavy, especially if you're painting 10 or 15 foot paintings, my favorite size. For larger paintings, I like using canvas. Canvas is made of cotton and comes in different thickness, measured by weight. 8, 10, 12 ounce are common. I prefer 12 ounce as I find that the lighter canvas rips more easily. They're also sold in different textures, from smooth to rough. Some people prefer the give and stretch of painting made on a stretched canvas. It can be an especially nice service when doing some soft blending. Many professional artists like to stretch their own canvases, but that's really not necessary when you're first learning how to paint. Pre-stretched canvases are readily available at your nearby art store and are mass produced in a factory making them very cheap, especially when they go on sale, which is practically every other week. These factory canvases are often stapled on the side, which I'm not a fan of, but you can't beat the price and convenience. If you're going to frame it, you won't see the staples anyway. If you got extra birthday money this year, another option is linen, the Rolls Royce of canvas. Linen is brown, sturdy fabric derived from flax. Linen is great for oil paints. It is more durable and also has a nice smooth texture. When you bring your factory canvas home, you'll notice that it is quite stiff and brilliantly white. This is because it has been treated with an application of gesso. Traditionally, gesso is made with chalk, white pigment, and rabbit skin glue, which couldn't sound more horrifying to me. It also smells very unpleasant, as I learned when my studio mates in grad school were cooking it up on a hot plate in their studio. There are modern water-based substitutes for rabbit skin glue but most people now use modern acrylic gesso for oil and acrylic paintings. Gesso is critical for oil painting because the rabbit skin glue serves as a barrier between the fibers of the canvas and the oil paint, which contains linolenic acid that will gradually decay the canvas over time. Acrylic paint is not acidic like oil paint is, but you'll still want to use gesso in general. If you don't, the paint will soak right into the canvas and lose its body and vibrancy. Sometimes artists do this intentionally to achieve a staining effect. But for our purposes now, we'll be using gesso on our paintings to keep the paint sitting on the surface. 
Factory canvases come with a thin layer of gesso and are perfectly fine to start painting on with no additional prep. However, the more gesso you put on your canvas, the better your paint will look. Gesso and other materials often come in economy, student, and artist grade. The cheapest gesso is often brittle and cracks easily, but it's affordable to learn with. The artist grade is the most expensive, but creates the nicest, most flexible surface. Flexibility is a must for me as many of my paintings won't fit through the door unless I roll them up. So once you have your surface selected, we can start painting. So much of successful painting relies on your dexterity with a brush. So let's do an exercise where we can practice some blending and brush handling techniques. Theoretically, you can use any kind of brush stroke you want to paint whatever you want. And there are some great examples throughout history of artists using the wrong brush mark with very cool results. But until you get to the point where you're revolutionizing the art world with your bold innovations, we'll practice using brushes and brush strokes that help us record our subjects more quickly and easily. Trees are an excellent subject to test out some brushes and brush strokes. I've gathered some silhouettes of different trees to use. Living in Missouri, I've become fond of trees and their endless variety. Trees are fascinating to me. You have the middle part providing height and strength, and then on each end, it branches off into hundreds of miniature structures with photoreceptors on one end and hydroreceptors on the other. They combine forces to make solid wood out of water, sunshine, and fresh air. These are some of the things I like to think about while painting trees. Let's paint a scene here with a soft gradient background and a few different trees so we can practice different types of marks. I'd like to get my palette ready first. We won't be using too many colors on this demonstration. We'll be keeping it somewhat simple, but I do want the basics. I'll be using titanium white, cadmium yellow, Pyrrole Orange, Cadmium Red, Primary Cyan, Ultramarine Violet, and Carbon Black. This will give us a pretty basic palette to start off with. Our primary colors, a few secondary colors, and black and white. I'm going to start with a large brush, get a little bit of water in it. Now for this I want to do a nice gradient from dark to light, like a sunrise or a sunset. I'll put more cooler colors at the top and warmer colors at the bottom. But I want to keep it nice and nice and thin. We want this to sit softly in the background rather than be too strong or dominant. So I've got plenty of water on my brush. I'm going to mix up a, a cool color here. See how loose the paint is and how watery it is? I don't want it to be too thick for this stage. So let's try this out. Getting some nice coverage here. So we'll start out blue at the top. Now I'm going to take my brush all the way to either side, gradually lightening up as I move down. Now let's start to warm it up a little bit. I'll grab a little bit of red. I don't want to be too abrupt of a change, so I'm going to keep blending it in. You'll notice the paint's starting to break up slightly. That's due to the amount of water we have. Let's get a little bit warmer, a little bit lighter here. I'll grab some yellow and orange. Just something real soft and subtle. And 
gonna dry my brush off a little bit, get some of the paint and water off, and come back across this with some light strokes. This will help reestablish our blend. There, now we've got a nice soft gradient ready to paint on. Now we've got our gradient. Let's give this a few minutes to dry. If you're in a big hurry, you can grab a hair dryer and dry it that way. Now that our canvas is dry, let's talk a little bit about basic brush handling techniques. Using your brush correctly will allow you to make the most of your strokes. You want to use the best type of brush for the types of marks you're making. Flats for angles, edges, and geometric marks. Round brushes for curvilinear lines for using organic shapes and marks. Pulling the paint rather than stabbing or pushing with the brush will give you smoother, more predictable results. Pushing the paint is fun too, but we'll use a different tool for that later. Let's try painting some trees. I'm going to mix up a dark color using a dark blue and some black and maybe a little bit of red. We just want a nice dark color for our silhouette, giving us a rich near black. It's important to get the right consistency as well. If your paint is too thick, you can't make a very long brush mark. If it's too thin, it'll drip all the way down your canvas. So I like to get somewhere in between. For this tree, I notice it's got a pretty geometric shape to it. It's got some straight lines and some angles. So I think a flat brush like this is gonna be a good, a good choice for this tree. So I'm gonna start at the bottom and I'm just gonna find that basic angle. Now I notice how the, the trunk separates here. Now as a tree grows up, it gets narrower. It starts out thicker at the base and then narrows as it goes. That's true for both the trunk and the branches. So as I paint this branch, I'm gonna gradually get thinner. I'm gonna turn my brush a little bit and let those let those branches come into shape. Let's find this middle trunk here. Gonna get a little bit narrower as we go up. As I turn the brush, the mark itself gets smaller. To where at the top, I've got this flat brush turned sideways, giving us a very thin mark. So I'm gonna do the major branches first these large ones. It's okay if it goes off the canvas. I'm paying special attention to how the branches turn. Do they turn abruptly? Do they turn gradually? Is there a knot? Is there a, a notch in the wood? These are some of the things I want to pay attention to to try to get a more realistic looking tree. So I've got my basic trunk and some branches here. Let's make this trunk just a little bit thicker. Now we can get in with some of these smaller branches. Now this brush may be getting a little too big for some of these. Let's go ahead and switch. I'm gonna to switch to a smaller, rounder brush. Help us get some of these smaller, rounder branches. And once you get the hang of it, it's quite fun. You can go rather quickly. You see, uh, a branch, start out thickly, then gradually pull your brush up to let it thin out. So now I'm getting these 
medium sized branches. We've got the larger ones in. I want to identify some of these ones. It's okay if it's not exact. This is a tree. There's no wrong tree. There are things that trees generally do. And we want to capture those, but it's hard to make a wrong tree. So as I get a lot of those branches in, now I think we're ready for a little bit of detail. So I'm going to switch to an even smaller brush and let us get some of these little bitty, little bitty branches. Again, I'm starting out thick and lifting my brush up as I go. Get those nice transitions. Looking for the general shape the branch makes. Each tree is going to have slightly different growth patterns to their branches. So if you're capturing a specific type of tree, you want to just take note of how the branches grow out. Do they grow out at a certain angle? All right, I think we're looking pretty good for this tree here. You'll notice it's not an exact copy as that's not my goal. My goal is to get a convincing silhouette of a tree that looks like it could exist. Let's take a look at this pine tree. Pine trees have a bit of a different structure to them, but lots of similarities. I'm going to start with a larger round brush. Mix up another nice dark silhouette color. And we'll do the same thing here. We'll start out thick and then gradually get thinner as we go up. Of course, trees are never perfectly straight. So I'm going to allow a little bit of movement as I move my brush, a little bit of natural movement. Let it wiggle back and forth a little bit. Now we've got a lot of dense information here. It's somewhat difficult to make sense of, but if we can break it down into some major branch areas, that'll help it give us some structure. Now the fun thing here is to pay attention to the details of these branches. That's how we're going to indicate what type of tree this is. This is a different tree than this tree. As an evergreen, we want to try to capture those the way the branches end, the types of clumps that evergreen trees make in their branches. And even though a tree follows a predictable large to small, there's lots of variations within that. Some branches are going to stick out further than others. Some are going to come in more. And you just want to employ some of that variety into your painting so it doesn't look like a fake plastic tree. These variations are going to help show that it looks like a believable, convincing tree. So I think I've got all the 
as far as I can with this larger brush. Let's move down to a, a medium sized brush and get some of these details in a little better. So I'm not painting individual needles, not necessarily even individual branches at this point. I'm going for the shape. I want to find the shape of the ends of the branches, the clumps of needles. That's what's going to give you an identifiable shape, an identifiable object. And since we're working in silhouette with just a single color here, it's going to go relatively quickly. We're not worried about changes in temperature or value so much. We're focused mostly on these marks. You want to get comfortable with the brush in your hand. Sometimes it helps to hold it like a pencil when you're doing small details. Other times it helps to hold it at the base of the brush and get a longer, more organic mark. So I just want to reestablish a few of these main branches. Get this overall shape here. Now we've got ourselves a couple of trees in silhouette. As long as you can get the right brush, get the right consistency, you should be able to practice these types of brush strokes, starting thick, getting thin as you pull your brush up, and you'll be able to make some beautiful trees and beautiful branches. As you get started developing your skills as a painter, the best practice is just to play around. The goal is to build comfort and experience with your materials. Have a canvas that doesn't have to be anything. You can just practice marks or blending or any other technique you want without any pressure. And play with different surfaces too. Try a panel. Try different canvases. The more comfortable you get with materials that work for you, the more fun and successful your painting endeavor will be.